We've been trained since kindergarten in our government schools to regard the media as authoritative and as you know, hardworking people fighting for the little guy and trying to present the truth. Yet we see many, many examples of the little guy. Nicholas Sandman is a very obvious example. Uh, those cadets who are playing the circle game. Uh, the guy, here's an easy example. The guy who photoshopped CNN into that uh, gif with Trump wrestling them, CNN said, we reserve the right to sue you. Yeah, that's not to hunt him down and yeah. destroy him for creating a meme. Yeah. That's not looking out for the little guy. That's looking out for number one. This is the Rubin Report, and according to a Russian bot farm, I'm Dave Rubin. Quick reminder, guys, to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which gives you a 5% chance of actually seeing our videos in the feed. Pretty good. Joining me today is the author of The New Right, the host of the You're Welcome podcast, and the man that I've dubbed the Willy Wonka of politics, Michael Malice. Welcome back to the Rubin Report. Thanks so much. Well. Sir, where to start? Um, I think your outfit. Yeah. It reminds me of somebody, a former guest. I didn't see you until two minutes ago. You walked in here wearing this gorgeous little thing. Yeah, I've been known for this look for years. <laughs> Is that right? All of a sudden, I get phone calls. Who's this woman, Tulsi, who's been dressing like you? She's so nuts. She even put a streak in her hair to pass as me even more. And I looked this up. She says she's from this state called Hawaii. Hawaii. Yes. I never heard of this. There's a bunch of volcanoes in the middle of the Atlantic, and we're supposed to believe that this is a state. They live on volcanoes, rain of liquid metal, that they check the weather, and this is people. This is how they gerrymander the Electoral College. <laughs> and now they're trying to say Graham's a state. Graham. I asked my friend, where's Guam? Find to me on the map. He points to this little island by the booth. That's are Sicily. You, you saying Guam? Guam. Guam. Have Guam? you ever found Guam? They're making up words and making them states. This is how the fake news media gets over it. Anyway, getting back to her campaign, I think she's great. Yes. I've been following her very closely, and I think it's reprehensible what's being done to people like Tulsi Gabbard, the congresswoman from so-called Hawaii, and all the other Democratic outliers. Uh, this is a wonderful um, change in our politics where so many people are realizing the nature of the enemy. All right, so we're gonna talk about all of that stuff, but because a huge portion of our people just listen to audio, I do feel that I have to describe what you're wearing. Hunky. You are in a white leisure suit. It's a suit, this is a you're, business, it has yeah, a leisure suit. That seems like a leisure suit. You look like Leisure Suit Larry, or you look like Larry from uh, Three's Company, uh, or something like that, or, or, we can, we can do this or Don Johnson, to, or John Travolta. Don Johnson, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. White suit. But you are, no, this is very much the Tulsi Gabbard white no, suit. No, this is the Michael Malice look that Tulsi that Gabbard Tulsi appropriated. appropriated. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. No, okay, so you hit, you hit a whole bunch of stuff there. The reason that I wanted to have you back, because as you know, I find you to be one of the most interesting political thinkers out there. I do. Thank there you. There you go. I'm paying you a compliment right up front. You, you consistently strike me as someone that is always like, really on what I would say is the forward fringe of what's happening culturally and politically and the whole shebang. So let's, let's start where you just started there. That there suddenly seems to be a couple outliers with the Dems and uh, the DNC or the powers that be or the gatekeepers or the New York Times or CNN or whatever else you want to call that, not too happy. Yeah, them. for a long time, conservatives often get things wrong. Um, and I criticize them very heavily on my Twitter. And when I speak of them, I do so with great love and affection. Um, they have always argued that the media is a wing of the DNC. And what we're seeing recently now is it's more accurate to say that the DNC is a wing of the media. Because uh, you'll see things like anyone who deviates, as, as you mentioned earlier, from basically the media's party line is crushed. Let's, let's give an example. I'm a Democratic congressman, right? Let's suppose from Hawaii or some other, or from a real some, state. Some other magical A state that place. actually exists. Yes. And for three years, my constituents have heard CNN and MSNBC talk about Russia collusion, Russia collusion, Trump's Hitler, Trump's this, Trump's that. How am I as a politician, supposed to go back to my constituents and say, with a straight face, I think Trump's the worst president ever, I think he's a racist, concentration camps, uh, you know, despicable, he's ruined the presidency, but I don't think this is grounds for removing him from office. Mm -hmm. I don't have that space. So it's pretty clear who's the one who is leading the charge and who is following it. And for a long time, again, conservatives thought this was Republican versus Democrat. And now we're seeing that it's establishment versus outsider because we're seeing it how they treated Tulsi. We're seeing it how they treated Bernie and Andrew Yang. That's the special one. Because Andrew Yang 
is hardly some wide-eyed radical, right? right? He's a wonk. He's in many ways akin to Mitt Romney, uh, you know, in certain ways. He wears the math lapel pin. He wants people to succeed. Yeah, he's, he, a, he's a business guy and mostly a centrist. Right. Probably, or not probably, certainly way too big government for you, right? Sure. But, but at least you think he's a sort of functional human being and doesn't come out of the machine. Right, and he is, there have been many cases where he's basically been treated as if he doesn't exist. They use the wrong photo for him. He tweeted out that every other campaign gets to have um, people who represent them on your shows, but with him, it has to be him personally. Mm -hmm. So when people on the left are starting to realize, oh, this isn't about Republican versus Democrat, this is about us versus them, mm -hmm. and you could just as easily be a Democrat and be a them, uh, eyes are opening, and that is a very, very healthy phenomenon. I always say that the corporate press is the enemy of the people, and I think that's the moderate position. What is the corporate press? Really, like what is the psychological makeup of the corporate press that causes this whole thing? Sure, so basically what you have are the universities and that's where the evil starts. And we've been trained since kindergarten in our government schools to regard the media as authoritative and as you know, hardworking people fighting for the little guy and trying to present the truth. Yet we see many, many examples of the little guy. Nicholas Sandman is a very obvious example. Uh, those cadets who are playing the circle game. Uh, the guy, here's an easy example. The guy who photoshopped CNN into that uh, gif with Trump wrestling them, CNN said, we reserve the right to sue you. Yeah, that's not, to hunt him down and yeah. destroy him for creating a meme. Yeah. That's not looking out for the little guy, that's looking out for number one. Do, so, do you, I, I've asked a bunch of guests this, sure. but do you think there's a moment where something changed? Because it wasn't always this hard. It was Now I get it's being exposed now more because, because we can all immediately tweet out the truth the second you know, they, they pump out the lie. But do you think there were some other seminal moments somewhere along the road that- It was that always this horrible, and this is what conservatives don't appreciate. We all learn in high school about William Randolph Hearst, the Spanish-American War, Remember the Maine, and yellow journalism. And then they just kind of the record scratch, and now we're into today. Uh, I have a, a big thread on Twitter. Walter Durante is the prime example. He was a New York Times man covering the Soviet Union. And while Stalin intentionally committed a genocide via starvation of Ukraine, the Holodomor, he was putting out dispatches all the time saying, there's no problem. If there is a problem, it is malevolent propaganda. He said the Russian people, oh, it's, it's a little tough, but they're tightening their belts. Tightening their belts is a very interesting idiom in this context. And what, they, what Stalin did to these people is, uh, if you were a kulak, which meant landowner, but pretty soon meant anyone, if you had any food in your home, that was for the people. They ransacked your house and took it. And if you weren't starving, that's how they knew you were hiding food and that's who they targeted. So they would beat people mercilessly, they would tear their house upside down, kick them out in the streets you know, to, to starve. And uh, there was another reporter who, and going to this area was forbidden by the Soviet government. There was a reporter who jumped off the train, uh, went to a few villages, reported back what was happening, these horrors, and Durante was like, oh, you know, he's just an anti-Soviet agitator. So this has been going on for a very long time. Uh, they've always been hardcore, I call them jihadis without the testosterone. <laughs> they have been, hard, this is a, a yeah. very demented ide ideology that will do everything in its power to maintain its hold on power. And only now that they've been fact checked in real time and called out on their tactics in real time are people realizing, oh, I'm just gonna say one more point. It's not, I had this tweet yesterday, I said it's not about the corruption, it's about the depravity. If it was just, hey, I'm hiring my brother and he's getting paid too much money sitting his ass, no one would care. Yeah, this right, is we a, know they do that, that's fine. That's We'd fine. let that go, that, it's no like cares, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is about Amy Rohrbach and Jeffrey Epstein. When you have a network that knows <clears> that <throat> someone is engaged in the sexual trade of children and their concern is not getting an interview with Meghan Markle. And when this is exposed, instead of, coming clean, it's let's target the person who revealed this footage and get them fired at the network which they went to. It's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. But what do you think about the sort of psychological condition of these people? Like when I watch all of these clips of CNN anchors saying the reverse of the truth or Cuomo tweeting out that, you know, look at the way the right attacks Greta Thunberg when he went after Nick Sandman or just, all, you know, a kid, it, all of this nonsense that, they never stop. They seem completely psychologically unable to stop. And that strikes me as very, 
weird. You know, I sit with a lot of people, if you were to say something to me that was patently true, that was against what I believe, I would struggle with it, I would, we would work it through, I would ask you some questions, but I, I know myself, I would probably change my mind if you made a sure. compelling case. We now are in a point where there's a lot of compelling evidence that these people lie endlessly and nothing ever stops them. I, I don't even know that I would use the word lie and here's why. I talk about this heavily in the book. I regard uh, what I call the evangelical left, these types. When you're a, a, an adherent to a fundamentalist creed, facts do not change your opinion. In fact, contradictory facts make they, you they double actually, down. Yeah. Right. So if you are talking to someone who is a hardcore creationist and you show them fossils, they're not gonna wonder if creationism was wrong. They will regard this as evidence that their willpower and faith is correct, and this is just a test. And it's the exact same psychology. The contemporary, and I don't regard all leftists in this vein. I regard this specifically as these jihadi types. They have this vision that they are the ones who are going to save America and the world, and it's a degeneration of what happened 100 years ago called the social gospel, which was the premise that instead of an individual being saved, which is a basic premise of Christianity, it's the nation uh -huh. that has to be saved. However, when you have this worldview that a nation's soul can be saved, or the earth's soul can be saved, that means there is no space that is outside your purview. That means whatever someone watches, whatever someone does at home, Anything aspect of your life is subject to their domination and control. So it is an absolute totalitarian worldview, and they admit it. They, you know, other than maybe perhaps abortion, if you ask them what is a place where it's not your place to judge, they, they will just kind of, their eyes will sh shake. Yeah, well, they're Thanos, right? I mean, this is what I keep saying every week now. Thanos they, was successful. But, <laughs> but they might be successful. They're gonna have to kill a lot of people to do it, right? Uh, you know, Rand, Ayn Rand was on Donahue uh, in I, I've seen the clip a million times. Yeah. yeah, and he asks her, why are you so hard on these people? Why don't you, you know, just say I disagree? And she goes, because I look at them, they don't hesitate to sacrifice entire nations. So the people who like advocated for Venezuela, you know, and the horrors that are going on there. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, you know animals being eaten, you know, kids lying in pools of blood because you don't have hospital supplies during childbirth. No one who pushed for this was like, wow, I made a huge misjudgment. Yeah. There's th there's you gotta keep going because otherwise you have to turn it on yourself. Right, right? and there's yeah. never any accountability. Joanne Reed, who allegedly, by her own words, called the FBI about tweets that she sent out, <laughs> is still gainfully employed and the day after this brouhaha between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, where if Bernie had said, I don't think a woman can be elected, they're portraying it as him saying, I don't think a woman should be elected. Sure, yeah, yeah. She which had is a, a huge distinction a that huge everybody distinction. just like ran shot yeah. across. Yeah. Uh, and intentionally muddled. Yeah. She had a body language expert on to yeah. show that Bernie's lying. And here was the amazing part. The body language expert was like, when he was asked this question, he shrunk and got nervous. He's on national television being told, being asked to say, is his good friend lying about him? Who's not gonna get nervous? So when you watch a moment like that, the, the, the you know, can a woman be elected moment between the two of them, and then suddenly the audio leaks right after, yeah. and Elizabeth Warren walks up to him and says, you know, you just called me a liar. You called me a liar on national TV. television. When you see that, do you think that the entire thing is staged? Because that struck me as, Elizabeth Warren somehow coordinated something with CNN so that she knew the mics were on and she could just get a little more juice because they really do hate Bernie. Now, I despise all of Bernie's ideas, I, I think. All of them? Uh, we'll, let's, let, we'll get into okay. that in a little bit, but I would say 90% of them probably, but we'll, we'll do that. Um, that she though coordinated something, that something felt really off about that. Like, oh, this is just where they happen to have left the mics on. You know what it's like to have a mic on and be wandering sure. around and the amount of stuff that gets dropped. So uh, one of the things I talk heavily uh, in my work and in, in the new right is the concept of the red pill. And for those who don't know, the red pills from the, movie, from the documentary, The Matrix, and once you're a red pill, that is uh, the understanding that what we see as presented as truth in the corporate press is in fact a carefully constructed narrative designed to keep some very unpleasant people in power. So a lot of people are trained to think of a television screen as a window, mm -hmm. right? So when you're doing what you're doing, that's a red pilling. Like, wait a minute, what's the backstory that is leading me mm -hmm. to see what's happening here? If I had to guess, I would guess she just didn't care one way or another that she was, uh, that he probably did say something similar, but in an innocuous way, hey, do you think a woman get elected? And obviously women are gonna have an uphill battle, it's never happened before. And she's portraying it mm -hmm. as, you know, uh, you know, poor victim me. Uh, and she just wanted to confront him to look tough on the record. I think she genuinely felt um, 
uh, she does not handle a counterpunch very well. Mm. The best, uh, the best. Elizabeth Warren is not a dummy. She taught at Harvard. She's a bright woman. You know what I mean? And I'm not so sure teaching at Harvard makes one bright. It's. I mean, you forget how smart the average person is. So <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going by that standard. <laughs> so you have her with the, with Trump for a year. Take the DNA test. Take the DNA test. Take the DNA DNA test. She takes it and she goes there. I took it. And he goes, who cares? So he broke this woman's brain. And on some level, I feel a little bit bad for her. But, I don't, but the beauty of social media is, after that exchange happened, all her tweets are being bombed with snake, with snake emoji replies yeah. um, by Sanders supporters. And now he's taken all her support. So let's talk about that a little bit, because what I think you really are sort of an expert at is like the internet, the underbelly of the internet yeah. side of this. So when you see a moment like that, you know, the Sanders Warren thing, and then literally it was just thousands and thousands of people, whether you like trolls, lefties. trolling or not, but it was, right, it was lefties. lefties. Well, well, I find the Bernie people, and I'm, I'm critical of Bernie, obviously, especially on Twitter, um, I find the Bernie people to be the most unbearable on Twitter, the, the most hostile and, and huh. mean. And it's weird because they have, you know, the, most of them have roses in their emojis and they have their gender pronouns and sure. everything's about diversity and tolerance. But I find them to, to be the worst, but they really turned on her. But when you see a moment like that and then you see the people with the snakes come in and all the fighting after that, you, that's like your game, right? Like oh, you, yeah. you love this that is my world. Porn. Yeah. yeah, like uh, anytime you have this conflict and strife, um, it's beautiful, it's very healthy. Uh, I'm very much for as much political division as possible. I think when the parties get together or when one party gets together, you have things that are you know, abominations like Obamacare or you know, war. Uh, this is what happens when the two gangs uh, you know, drop their arms and decide to shake hands. So do you think if we just had sort of an endless internal battle within the parties so they could sort of not really do anything because they'd just be internally fighting, that that would put us in a better political situation because really not much could happen. Is yeah, that... and I think it's going to lead eventually to uh, kind of the breakup of the United States because this country has been united with basically thumbtacks and strings since the beginning and there's no reason for two or more cultures who have increasing contempt and an inability to speak to each other to be part of one polity. Was this the inevitable conclusion, do you think, of the melting pot? Because it's worked here better than it's worked anywhere else. Do you think that's a fair I premise? I don't think it's the because of the melting I mean, look at the Civil War. I mean, this has been from the beginning. I mean, you ha with the, at the very beginning, it was the North that wanted to secede because they, I mean, culturally, they're very opposed. And actually, before the melting pot, the argument was, well, we're the uh, Anglo-Saxons in the North and they're Teutonic or Scottish, whatever. I don't remember what they were in the but South. But we got through all that. I mean, we had a Civil War and then but we, we became a united it. nation. No, we didn't. Because for mean? decades, the South was regarded as the subordinate conquered land with boy and to this day uh, you know people you just we just saw that in CNN people just regard the South as this kind of degenerate version of the rest of the United States sure I'm not saying there aren't elites and people that mock each other and all that but we have one functional country and you can travel to the South and travel to the North and do commerce and all of those things like I get it I'm not saying there aren't tensions sure. and all that but even within that we've, we've still remained basically peaceful Sure, and I think you, the, I think one of the big misconceptions, and this is another uh, idea, is that if there's going to be any segregation, uh, separation, or segregation, self-segregation, it has to be violent. And a great counterexample of this is Brexit. You know, uh, Britain's leaving the EU; uh, they're doing it. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a long divorce, but they're doing it peacefully. So there's, I think, increasingly uh, there is an understanding that there's no need, and social media is speeding this up. Mm -hmm. It's ca causing people to go to their logical extremes uh, in terms of politics, and there's less less room in the middle, which is exactly what I like because I think when you're in the middle, that means you don't really have any principles. So if this thing gets to what I guess you would say is its inevitable conclusion, then what, Not what inevitable, are, what, so I'm hoping. That's why I'm pushing it, but yeah, I don't think uh, it's inevitable. It, oh, you don't think it's inevitable. No. Okay, so if it gets to the conclusion that Michael Malice sees down the road, what is that? Uh, freedom. It's uh, not having you know the biggest government on earth you know taking all this money out of you. Uh, you know obviously the ultimate conclusion would hopefully be an anarchist system, but we've got a long way to go to tear down uh, this Goliath that's been built up over centuries. And I, I think it's wonderful that Trump and the Democrats are both bringing such disdain and disrepute to the electoral system and democracy in general. Is that the ultimate flaw of the lefties that? for what you may agree with them on the parts where Bernie will talk about crony capitalism or that sort of stuff that you don't like, or the big money in politics and all that, that the answer is always exactly what the problem is. His answer is always give it more money. His answer is always give it more power. Where a more libertarian answer, your answer, I think something closer to my answer would be, will you starve the freaking beast 
you just starve it till it has no more power. No, I think their central problem is their obsession with equality at any cost. And because even if they weren't involved in government, they're still going to be pushing this kind of bizarre equality agenda, which has death, uh, deathly consequences. Did, well, did you see, I, I was just on Tucker Carlson because Elizabeth Warren wants a 50% female and non-binary cabinet, Well, which is... Very important, I would imagine. You know, but there's even there's more nefarious consequences. You had in uh, Florida uh, with that school shooting. Basically, this kid um, was telling them that I'm going to uh, uh, shoot up the school, and they said, "Well, sane kids don't do this. We're going to put you in special ed." And then you, well, I forget, uh, Nicholas Cruz, his name, mm -hmm. um, and Andrew Pollock, his dad wrote a book about this because uh, his daughter was killed. So then they don't want to report him because then you have the school to prison pipeline. They mm -hmm. want to have the good statistics. And eventually what the logic of the left is, if one person has a problem, everyone has to have that problem because mm -hmm. that's equality. And he came and true to his word, he shot up that school. And it's like, we all saw this coming, but because you are obsessed with this idea that everyone has to be treated the same or treated fairly, uh, you know, it leads to death. It leads to the uh, uh, meat grinder. So even though you like this idea of the internal fighting, do you think like AOC has been making a point, which again, this is someone who I disagree with on most of the stuff, but I think she does get one every now and again, which is she's basically been saying, why am I in the same party as Joe Biden? That does make sense to me. These people have really nothing, no matter how woke Biden tries to become now, you know, he's trying at this end stage, which is sort of sad, but it's like, they shouldn't be in the same party, should they? Well, I mean, America is very unique because most of the European countries have like parliamentary systems where they have like nine parties. Like in Iceland right now, there's a party that's just dedicated to people with disabilities and they yeah. have seats in the parliament. So they get that specific and issue driven. Yeah. The fact that we only have- Which has its own set of problems. Of the course way. it does. Yeah. And it's hard to form coalitions and so yeah. on. The fact that we only have two parties with a country that's what, 350 million, and those are supposed to cover everyone's views. This is an example of why uh, politics is landline technology for a Post cell phone world. Mm -hmm. uh, that we go back in the 80s, you know, every terrible comedian would joke about, oh, there's Coke, and now there's Diet Coke, and there's Cherry Coke. What's next? Caffeine free Cherry Diet Coke? Yeah, you could have that, and that's not a problem. <laughs> but why do I have to have two choices, and those choices are Coke or Pepsi, when I pr would prefer not to drink soda at all? And that is not an option, and it's, it's getting hard. And in Europe, we're seeing this very heavily, the fragmentation. It's getting very, very hard to form coalitions of 51%, and that's wonderful. Yeah, because it, Israel's I, had what seventeen elections in a row, and they can't crazy. form a government. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a very healthy thing that people are regarding the two parties as not being representative of them and their views. So for a guy that's obviously not on the left, that doesn't, you know, particularly subscribe to those ideas, what would a sane left look like? Because I I think maybe you would want some level of a sane left, right? I think there's a lot of sane left. I yeah. think so. If what, you are, so what is a sane uh, left? All it takes is being red pilled recognizing, because here's why I can talk to the Bernie people, here's why I can talk to the Tulsi people, if I ever found this Hawaii imaginary place. Yeah. Here's why I could talk well, the to the Tulsi people, people are listening right now. Yeah. I don't know if the Bernie people Because are. once you realize that y we are being manipulated, lied to, and tried to be controlled, and we're also told that anyone who says these things is a conspiracy theorist, yeah. so right away you don't have to listen to him, you yeah. know, um, even though the Weinstein conspiracy has been demonstrated, the Epstein conspiracy has been demonstrated, the Constitution was written as a conspiracy, they met in secret and you know, basically threw out the law and said we're just gonna overthrow the government. All these things were conspiracies. Once you realize this, then you can have an honest conversation. I have not had that Bernie experience that you had, but you're more higher profile than I am. But that is a starting point where it's like, let's talk honestly instead of having these two minute hates trying to you know, destroy people on a personal level, which maybe they do, I don't understand. I, I, again, I'm not familiar with the Bernie crowd, but that is the starting point of a sane left. Because there's- But then what is it actually, like what are the ideas? On. I'm just gonna yeah. say, no, none, no one I know would have a problem with a lefty who says, I believe in a welfare state. I don't want to live in a country where people are starving in the street. I don't think someone should be bankrupt because they got cancer. And I want my kids, even if they're destitute, to be able to have a decent quality of education. That's the same lefty. Yeah. And I don't think anyone- Well, would I'd have say that's that. an old school liberal, basically. Well, yeah, right? It wants, of, it wants a little more government than an ANCAP wants. Sure. But it's to, to help people. Right. The libertarian people would say, well, you're actually not helping them. You're ending sure, up keeping them on that's the Sure, but that's an easy conversation to have. Yeah. Uh, that's very different from uh, you know, this kind of fundamentalist faith where overnight, 
we have to care not only about trans people, but specifically transgender bathrooms. Not any other trans issue. Right. This is the one trans issue. And if you don't care about this one specific sub-issue of this greater issue, you can be read out of polite society. That is coming from a place of domination and control, not a place of uh, empathy and sympathy. It's a really great way of looking at it because remember when that whole transgender bathroom thing happened in, was that in North Carolina? Yeah. And then suddenly the NBA said, we're not gonna have the all-star game here. And Obama said, we're gonna cut funds to the state and all of those things, and it's like, guys, we're, have, we're trying to have some level of a decent conversation, and you guys have now taken this to, we're literally talking about the power of the federal government over transgender bathrooms. And, yeah. and, and that's the dangerous part here for most people, I think. Yeah, I think people, uh, for a long time, the corporate press has been very good at using persuasion, and now that the you know animus toward them is at all-time highs and hopefully will keep escalating, their mask is dropping and they're demonstrating they're perfectly comfortable uh, using their B move, which is force if necessary. Do you think they think they're getting away with it? So a great example of this would be just what happened to Joe Rogan in the last little bit. So oh, Rogan beautiful. basically endorsed Bernie. He didn't even. But, he, but not even quite, he said, right? He said, vote for him. He, he, right, so, he was, so everyone was saying it was an endorsement, but it was basically like, I like the guy, he's been yeah. consistent over the years, something like that. And CNN, from CNN's main verified Twitter account, literally said something to the effect of Bernie Sanders under heat because he takes the endorsement of homophobic, racist, Islamophobic comedian Joe Rogan. And it's like, you, know, you don't have to love Rogan, and I get it, he's been included on scary charts that you and I have been included yes. on. You know, these charts, they're yes. out there. Sometimes they put, you know, little well, lines next to yeah. each other, and then it's like, oh my God, you But that's not a conspiracy theory. That, that, right, that's not, <laughs> yeah, you're right, exactly, exactly. And then, then yeah, all right, we'll put that aside for a sec. Um, but when you see that, it's like, whew, they, are, they got almost nothing left But now. this is the tactic of theirs that I've called out. I have a master thread on Twitter. It's called as an aside. So for example, if I was describing you as someone who's an objective or even biased, let's suppose I'm a biased journalist and I don't like you. Yeah. I would still say Dave Rubin, comma, who is a popular podcaster, comma, said blah, 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 right? That's an accurate framing. The, yeah. Their first sentence is always to ascribe the most nefarious framing possible to this person. Right so wing, the reader right, far right. No, hold on, reader right away knows this is someone to avoid. Joe Rogan, comma, who has a history of making homophobic and racist <laughs> jokes, comma, if you had to describe Joe Rogan, look at his Wikipedia, that's not what he's known as. MMA, comedian, podcaster, no one would define him that way unless you are telling and training your audience what to think. It's completely disingenuous, and that's the difference between having a bias and having an agenda. If it was a bias, they said Joe Rogan, popular podcast, however, he's gotten controversy for this, you, you show both sides. That's not what they're doing. They're telling you front and center, this person is the enemy, and you should shun him. And what's beautiful is, uh, look who the corporate press has needlessly alienated through their chicanery. Rogan fans, Tulsi fans, Bernie fans, Andrew Yang fans, Trump fans, Kobe fans, Don Imus fans. It's amazing. They can't help themselves because again, when you have a fundamentalist faith, you are certain that you're on the side of the angels. That is a tough one to fight, huh? <laughs> Fine mess for us. It's easy yeah. because they're delusional and not in touch with reality. So as I mean, if you, if I, there's an asymmetry between truths and lies, right? If I tell you a hundred truths and one lie, you're gonna look at me as a liar. If I kill one person and never kill anyone else, I'm still a murderer, yeah. right? So if I'm presenting myself as an objective news organization and I'm caught once, twice, 12 times, the average person who doesn't have any political persuasion one way or another will not look at me as trustworthy. And once trust is lost, it is almost impossible to be regained. So with that in mind, let's talk about this clip that went viral, the CNN oh, clip. Yes. Uh, it's Don Lemon, uh, who's their you know, main anchor. Don, Don used to be a friend of mine. He was on this show. I'm not here to throw the guy under the bus. Don Lemon, but, comma, who used to be a Ruben <laughs> guest, comma. <laughs> yeah, exactly, who must be on a chart with Dave Rubin. Um, yeah. And it was Rick Wilson, who is a, is he a Republican strategist? Ostensibly, yeah. S supposedly, right? Yeah, I mean, he thinks he's a that's what it says under his name. And the other person was? Fareed, I forget his name, and I'm gonna sound racist if I try. All right, so we, all right, and some other guy, but it's three of them, they've got their heads in boxes on yeah. CNN, and can you just describe what happened and, and then the reaction to well, it? Well, it's mean, such a perfect example of all of this. There was a lot to unpack in this clip. Yeah. So Rick Wilson was making the joke that Trump is so dumb that he couldn't find Ukraine on a map, right? This is, you know, 101 ha, humor, ha, right? Ha, ha, and Don Lemon, so it was, original. there's this, there's this mental, there's this condition called Angelman syndrome, 
And when kids have it, they can't help but laugh all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of disturbing because they'll be in their crib just cracking up. And he just loses it as if it's the funniest thing he's ever heard. And I'm, I'm like, this is first grade uh, playground stuff. It's not clever. And they start going off on how all these Trump voters are like, oh, you guys are elitists with your geography and your lines on yeah. the map. It and all felt extremely produced. Like, do you think that was spontaneous? I think it was very spontaneous. Really? Because they were riffing off each other. Yeah, uh, and know. here's my point. There's something I, I talk about in the book called midwits. And you, you tell me why you think it's not that you're not spontaneous. Because the way they were riffing off each other, these people don't riff off each other well. Like when no. you see when you see Lemon and Cuomo do it, it's horrible. It's so stilted. You can tell these people don't really like each other. They have this awkward minute between their shows when they do it. And also, I know a lot of these people. Like you know a lot of these yeah. people. Like the way they are and, and their ability to be human on camera, it's not like this. It, it, literally, it's not like this, yeah, yeah. what we're doing right now, where it's like we have cameras on us, but we're acting basically the same. You know, there's always like, you turn a camera on, what's that What's that theory? You know, there's that. There's a name for that theory when you turn a camera on. Oh, I that, don't know, um, okay. I, I can't remember what it's called, but but we're basically acting like ourselves and there's nothing suddenly that this camera goes off that I'm gonna, Absolutely. our interaction would be wildly different, as right? I said we, at the beginning, we went out to dinner a couple weeks ago, is this, right? As I said at the beginning of the show, this is how I dress all this the time. This is exactly what you were wearing, you were wearing the Tulsi the last no, time the I No, the malice saw look that Tulsi appropriated. Right, 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 I keep forgetting. Um, but so it struck me as the level that Don was laughing did not strike me as uncontrollable laughter. It struck me as uncontrollably fake laughter. Interesting. And the way that they were all bouncing back and forth was like they had planned this. Like they need something to go viral. Like, I don't know. You, you might be right and maybe it's somewhere in between what we're both saying. It, both theories are so stupid. It's hard to figure out which supports the reality, right? I'm hearing what you're saying yeah. and it's completely plausible. They sat down and did like the worst improv class in history. Yeah. But the, the, there's a couple of things in that uh, um, clip that I thought are very cogent. There's this concept called midwits that um, is, I mentioned in my book, which is about people who are marginally intelligent, right? Mm -hmm. When you're barely smarter than average, but you have de are desperate to demonstrate your brilliance, yeah. right? Because there's very few chances where you're gonna be the smart one. If you're six foot, you are tall, you're above average, but when are you gonna be the tall guy? Never. So to think that being able to find Ukraine who everyone who's played Risk can, find, it can be found on a map as a sign of your brilliance speaks to your intelligence. And the other point is Jim Goad, the, the writer who wrote the Redneck Manifesto, he made the point that every single stereotype that was applied in the past toward poor, low-status blacks was overnight by these same people applied to poor, low-status whites. Mm -hmm. You go back and watch that clip and those accents that they do and those voices, oh, those lines in that book learning, they are one sec, they're 60 years away from saying the N-word about the same kind of population. It's, it's a status thing and racism and classism have always been very hand in hand in this country. So then what is going on in their minds in a segment like that? Do they honestly think that they are helping whatever the cause is I, that they This is believe? what I think. Yeah. I think now they are in retreat I think they get a lot of heat on social media where people call them out on their mal malfeasance and depravity and they're getting defensive and now they are being sarcastic because sarcasm is often a sign of cognitive dissonance where your brain has two contradictory ideas and can't reconcile them. So for them, the idea that maybe, I, I always tweet at this at these people, I go, have you ever wondered if maybe you're one of the bad guys? Uh, the idea that we're not better than everyone else, that we're not particularly bright, it's true, but it's very disturbing to their self-image because, hey, I'm on CNN, I'm on a panel. Clearly, I'm brilliant. And no, Anna Navarro's on those, pa on those panels. She's not brilliant. She's a William Howard Taft. She's also called me racist on Twitter, oh. so, you know. Anna uh, Navarro, comma. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah, who's called Dave Ruin racist, yeah, yeah. comma. Um, who sat down with Michael Malice, comma. Yeah. Who was, uh, you know, yeah. Tulsi Gabbard appropriated the comma. Yeah. Okay, um, it reminds me of um, something that happened to me about a year ago, a good friend of mine who I went to, I grew up with, I went to college with, we both studied political science together, we've been friends for you know, our whole lives, you know, 40 some odd years. Um, he's a huge lefty now, obviously we diverged politically, but we went out for a drink and we sort of got into it and he was getting very heated and I just kept trying to get yeah. out of politics, yeah. I tried, and I'm sure you've been in a million of these where you just, you try to let it go and there's something that's beyond politics and I was trying to talk about his kids yeah. and everything else going on. And he, we couldn't get there and I finally said to him, I said, do you think that I believe what I believe as much as you believe what you believe? Oh, great question. And without pausing, with no hesitation, he said no. And I thought, 
and oh, and then wow. yeah, and this is a really rare, this is a really rare moment for me. It then it then really escalated, and I've never done this before. I swear to you, I've never done this before. Dave Rubin, uh, I threw, never I, done this before. <laughs> <laughs> I, I threw money down. I paid for the whole thing, the whole tab right there, and I walked out. I've never done anything like that before, and it's so counter to write everything you know about me. But I thought that moment right there, like you have to sit in that now. The, the uh, like I'm not attacking your motives, but you actually believe that I can't believe what I purport. Uh, what's amazing is there is a continuum and there's lots of people who would blurt that, that out and as soon as they heard themselves say it, they'd be like, whoa, 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 oh, okay, I've gone down the wrong path. And there's, but the thing is they've been so trained, uh, especially the last few years. If you ask one of these types, is it possible that Trump is just crappy, mediocre, Billy McKinley, is that okay with you? And they're not gonna really have an answer because it's very important that he is the worst president who's ever lived. Although by, there's very few metrics where you can make that argument. Are you finding that there is an undercurrent of support for Trump now that did not exist last time, that suddenly this thing has gone so bananas, everything we've been talking about for this half hour, that now there's people that would have never considered voting for Trump the first time, that basically still see the wheels on the machines, still see some level of pride in America, still see paychecks that are working and unemployment that's low and black unemployment that's low and Hispanic unemployment that's low and they like getting rid of some of the regulation and all of those things and we're not in extra wars and he's trying to get us out of Afghanistan and everything else, that suddenly people that could, would have been completely um, in opposition to Trump last time I think um, a lot of there. I think a lot of them are just going to be happy to stay home. They're going to be like, "Look, I can't bring myself to vote for this guy. He's, you know, we can think of all the names, but I'm not going to endorse this." Uh, especially if Biden is the nominee. I gave Biden money because when he went in front of these coal miners and <laughs> yeah, told them yeah, that yeah, if yeah. you know how to shovel coal, you can learn how to program a computer. I'm like, I need a year of this. He please. literally did the learn to code meme. I mean, for those <laughs> for people though. that, but but for people that know about this meme, this was a meme that when what was it? Was it BuzzFeed when BuzzFeed was going to unionize? Yeah, they, basically, they laid off a lot of journalists, yeah. and and they're all boo. Um, and then all the trolls, and the, I use the word trolls in the good sense, just yeah. added them a hashtag learn to code. Yeah. And people got kicked off of Twitter for Meaning this. learn how to do something productive right. instead of being a BuzzFeed employee. Right. And Biden actually brought it to life. But he also brought it to life in to, a, it's an audience where it's not accurate. Right. right? It is, if you know how to write for BuzzFeed, you could probably have the technical skills to learn how to code on a basic level. Right. If you're a coal miner, that does not mean you know how to use a computer well. This is not, and by the way, if you're a computer programmer, you can't mine coal either. These do not transition very easily. So, and uh, I think it was Comfortably Smug who tweeted out that you do know if there's the debates, Trump is gonna bring that stripper and put her in the front row and ask Joe if he's met his granddaughter and it's going to be just complete chaos. So I, I hope he's the nominee very desperately. But watching him, is sort of depressing, right? Depressing like, I know, so I know this is where you wouldn't, it's depressing in that for, for someone that's a little more old school politics and not on the, the fringe of the new right, yeah. that for someone that like, you know, I want the system to somehow function, even though I always tell you, it's like, I love all the intellectual adventures I go sure. on with you, I really do. But for someone that wants like something to kind of hold that was somewhat centrist and we could have an interesting- But that's Biden. No, but he can't do it anymore. It seems like he can't oh, do yeah. it, which is why he's telling these guys to code. It's why he's saying you can pick your gender depending on which jail you want to go to. He said that? Yeah, at, oh, you did, at the Equality Forum. Oh, he I said, love him so much. He said, it's not what uh, birth sex you are, it's what you identify as. You're gonna have an awful lot of male rapists in women's prisons. He literally said that. He was brought in as the sane guy and he can't be sane. But, but I think that gets to your point that this thing just eats through everything. Yeah, yeah right, I, and I, he, again, he doesn't have that space within his party. Uh, I, I can't believe he said that about the jails. I mean, this is hilarious. But yeah, I, mean, I am not making it up. How are, you, how are you not, how is this depressing to you? This is glorious, yeah. I, don't, I can't, uh, just Here, like your you know friend what? at dinner. You know I what, I'm telling my guys right now, we're gonna, we'll play the clip right now. In prison, the determination should be that your sexual identity is defined by what you say it is, not what in fact the prison says it is. And in that case, you should be entitled also to OGBYN. Anyway, uh, you didn't ask that question, but you're not <laughs> likely to either, I guess. Well, there you go, Malice. That's the man that you want to be the Democratic candidate for president of Des the United desperately. States. Desperately. Um, one of the things that this speaks to is one of the best aspects of conservatism, which is asking questions like, what do you, when you're advocating for a program, 
what do you do with the people who will use this program in bad faith or this law in bad faith? And very often people on the left don't have an answer or they'll hand wave it away like, oh, there won't be that many cases. Well, that don't be that many cases, again, is Nicholas Cruz in Florida shooting up a school. It's that outlier that both moves culture and also is the destroyer. And that is who we should be concerned about. What else are you tracking right now? Um, what, what else is on your mind out of the, the that's unearthed in, I've the, been, in the bottom of the internet, in the I, well? I've been, so I've been engaging in like psyops with a lot of these types. So for example, when you're working on a campaign, you're going to have tunnel vision. Bunk, you're, going, you're living in a bunker, right? So when there's an article that comes out in the New York Times, everyone in the campaign is freaking out. How's this going to play? How are the other campaigns? You, you kind of have, it's like Plato's cave, very limited information. So what I do is I have a bigger Twitter following than many of these campaign managers for these candidates. So I will, instead, people tweet like nasty things at them. That'll str strengthen their resolve. If you're saying, oh, Warren's this and that, it's like, yeah, I'm fighting for her against yeah. you. So I will be like, hey, at Roger Lau, latest polls came out from Iowa. Five of the six candidates have solidified their support. Only Warren has lost support. How depressed are you at the campaign on a scale of one to Anthony Bourdain? Uh, and then that gets retweeted and you know it's filling up his notifications yeah. and he's already having a bad day and now he's gonna be freaking out even more, hopefully. So you're, instead of killing them with uh, attacks, it's not quite kindness you're killing them, oh, it's but not you're, killing, you're killing them with sarcasm, basically. It's not sarcasm, yeah. this is a sincere it's, question. I mean, it, it, this right. is, I'm, the, I'm giving the devil on their left shoulder steroids and being like more insecurity, more fear, more freaking out, and just ginning up that kind of, I mean, I can't imagine working a campaign is in a state of constant stress and, and panic and you're putting out fires all the time. So let's add some gasoline and watch it burn. How concerned are you that the, at the social media level and at the big tech level that the game has been so rigged and manipulated already that we have no idea what's going on. I, you know, I keep mentioning this thing about uh, shadow banning is now in Twitter's terms of service. Okay. They can literally throttle accounts. We've, we've known sure, that they've been doing course. it forever, but now they're telling us they're doing it as of January 1st and we all just keep playing the game as if the game is not being rigged. But the game is always going to be rigged. I mean, when you have your enemies, to expect them to play fair is extremely naive. This is my Soviet mindset yeah. talking. Yeah. Uh, we did have a president who tweeted his way into the White House. And I think what people don't appreciate is the existential angst it causes someone who works at a social media company to see their product or their program being, from their perspective, subverted by those who they despise to further their agenda. This must cause them a lot of grief. But doesn't it also cause them to you know, tighten those spigots and make sure that as we get closer to the election that Michael Malice isn't gonna be heard as much or Trump's not gonna be heard as much or, or Rubin or anybody else? I mean, sure, I mean, the, the thing but is- But we all pretend that that's not really it. Like that would be the thing that we would all be relentlessly talking about, right? If, I, if I, we really were trying to change something here? I, I think they are losing tools in their toolbox. Uh, and I think, I mean, you know, Kamala Harris, you know, was calling for Trump to be banned from Twitter. Remember this? Yeah. Uh, and she got pushed back even from the left. And, and when she lost her uh, campaign, I did a ham tasting on my live stream and we tried, you know, different kinds of hams from all over the world because the pig was finally roasted. So I, I think they are going to try different tactics, but because they're being called out on their tactics instead of being called out on the issues, this is why they are freaking out. It used to be, they would say, Dave Rubin's a racist, and you would spend months being like, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. Now it's Dave Rubin saying, look at their technique mm -hmm. of calling me, Rogan, everybody else a racist as a means of preemptively dismissing them. So by you calling out their technique, it loses almost all its efficacy. You know, it's funny because like three years ago, let's say when Daily Beast or Mother Jones or any of these awful things, these, these what do you call it? You call them jihadists? Uh, jihadis without the testosterone, yeah. yes. Whenever they were doing that and they would call me all these things, you know, I'd, I'd fight back and then, you know, I could occasionally get them to change one sure. line or whatever, but then they wouldn't, they wouldn't actually retweet the thing. They would just change it and nobody's seen yeah. it and whatever. It's out stealth there for, edit. it's out there for then, right, stealth edit so then Wikipedia can grab from it and, right. and the rest of it. But it used to really upset me, obviously, when I first, you know, like anyone that starts getting that heat, it, it, yeah. it's hot at first. And in a weird way now, um, because I have a book coming out in April and I know what that is gonna cause that, that microscope to look at me or you know, uh, really fine tune on me, is that I'm glad that I went through it now. Yeah. Do you find that too, that you've been through a lot of the, the hits on this stuff and it's like, 
that actually makes you stronger now. Oh, and especially it makes my audience stronger because they love it. Because yeah. because there's it's like a greatest hits album, right? So it's xenophobic, racist, homophobic, blah blah blah. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm an immigrant. You yeah. know what I mean? So when they st I, I, uh, when I went after George Soros. Oh, this can you talk? Yeah, talk about this because this, this is a this was this is exactly why I think you're such a great thinker. Truly, what what this whole Soros thing? Oh, it was beautiful. Yeah. So uh, some guy from the Atlantic, and I'm not trying to be dismissive. I genuinely don't remember his name. Um, the Atlantic's pretty terrible these days. Pretty, they've been, but Dave. They've See, been this is where they've yeah, been yeah. terrible since Woodrow Wilson. Don't I mean even before I mean, the nation? I mean these people were the ones agitating for World War One. I. I mean you have to go back. So. Um, they, there was, Rudy Giuliani made a comment that he's more Jewish than George Soros. Now, in any other context, uh, if you were talking to Jewish people and said, someone can be culturally Jewish without actually having Jewish ethnicity, as opposed to someone could have Jewish ethnicity and basically be a total goy, right? This is not controversial, this is very well known. And every, right? everyone knows this. Obama kept saying he was the first Jewish president. Yes, this yeah. is very known. Yeah. We were both Jewish, we know people who are super Jewish and then people who are basically wasp and then people who are adopted Jews, basically, you yeah. know, who like the culture. Um, and the guy from the Atlantic was like, oh, in the world of Trump, someone can be less Jewish than somebody else. And he's saying this about a literal Holocaust survivor, right? Referring to Soros. Yeah. But what was amazing is, in the same way it's Dave Rubin, comma, <laughs> secret Klansman and homophobe, comma, it's George Soros, comma, literal Holocaust survivor. Now, I always say the corporate press is factual, but not truthful. It is factual yeah. that George Soros survived the Holocaust. He was Jewish. He was in Hungary, I believe. Yeah. Uh, he was under Nazi occupation. His life was in danger. However, the, and in any other context, people would, under, would not even argue. The experience of Jews who fled Germany and got to America is not the same as the experience of Jews who survived occupied territory is not the same as a Jew who escaped the camps or survived the camps. Mm -hmm. These are three, they're all Holocaust survivors. These are, these are separate things. But by using that term, they're trying to say George Soros, yeah. multinational billionaire, is beyond criticism specifically because of the Holocaust. And they came at me, blah, 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 and I, I'm like, look, I was born in Ukraine, uh, my family survived the Nazis and the commies, I went to yeshiva, you're not, I've been circumcised three times, you're not gonna out Jew me. That, that's pretty excessive. So some guy came at me and he's like, oh, you know, my grandfather died in the Holocaust, family history doesn't matter, sometimes you could just be a jerk. And I go, I paused, this is one of the few times I paused before I tweeted, I go, I was wondering who died and made you an insufferable prick, but now I guess we know. Because you are not going to wave your grandfather's ashes at me to win some Twitter beef to defend George Soros. And I said to the Atlanta guy, I said, if you want to make George Soros out to be some sort of modern day Anne Frank, I can't stop you. But this is what they do all the time. It was really funny, especially Kamala Harris is a great example, because they couldn't figure out a criticism of her was racist or sexist. Right. So whatever the, the there's only like 10 words to use, and once you say, I'm not even having this argument with you, they have no power. But it, isn't it the irony that it's also the people that find bigotry everywhere can't find it when it's actually right there? Oh, sure. This happens constantly. I mean, Soros is such a great example. It's the guy's given hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, to all these NGOs that basically are just trying to destroy Israel. This is not, so he may be Jewish, but is he a, a friend of the Jews or whatever that even means? Like, but here's not the thing. by any logical even, explanation. Even if he literally was taken out of Auschwitz, and thankfully he was, you know, that he, he had a much easier, uh, Certainly, I don't wish that on anybody. Almost, uh, he, the idea that a billionaire is beyond it's beyond reproach. Yeah, I mean, this is the number one person. Uh, Koch brothers, Soros, Shell Nadelson. These are the number one people. Tom Steyer who should be subject to scrutiny because they're using their wealth to influence the political process. That's the number one person that you want to look at with skepticism. So to have them run interference for Soros in the name of the Holocaust was so uh, off-putting to me. And I was very glad that I'm like, I'm not backing down from these efforts, like not for one second. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, and, yeah. and it was great. Yeah, you didn't. What do you make of the, the billionaire crew, so the Bloomberg Steyer crew that desperately want in on the DNC now, or what's happening with the Dems? And it's like, you guys, do you have any idea, even if you could buy the nomination, what the radical activists will do to you at the end? Tom Steyer. What a loser. I mean, you're gonna be a billionaire and he's just, be he's, he stands there with Bernie like, please don't throw me in the pit of Sarlacc. Please don't throw me in the pit of Sarlacc, you know. He, we had, the Republicans we had back in the day, Maury Safer, Maury Taylor. Yeah. He was, he ran I think in 96 or something. He was some kind of big businessman. It is 
watching Tom Steyer talk, and it's like it's very cute because when you reach a certain amount of money, right? My understanding is uh, you will have people who will tell you what you want to hear in order to be your consultant. So they sat down with him, like, yeah, yeah, Trump did it. Why can't you? So I, I think it's fun to watch him, but I don't think he's going anywhere. Bloomberg, of but, course, but what do you make of the way he kisses the ass of the socialist? Like, doesn't it just strike you as the most pathetic? No, I think this is the guy who, there's a lot of these types. They made it on Wall Street, but they want to be with who they perceive to be the cool kids. Mm -hmm. And now he's on stage with Bernie, and I think he's genuinely excited. Oh, it strikes me as so pathetic. I'm not oh, even, I don't, I don't even think, think I don't, I don't think you're wrong necessarily. I that think just it's strikes cute. me. Uh, but the idea that this guy, Bernie, who really has so many counter ideas to what allowed Steyer to become a billionaire, and he just gets up there and he's like a little yipping dog around Bernie, and Bernie's always like, shoo, shoo. Listen, it just seems so pathetic. Listen, when Tulsi followed me on Twitter, there may have been shrieking and running back and forth in my home. Yeah. So I am not in a position <laughs> ah, to judge ah. Tom Steyer to be excited to be debating Bernie. Where do you think Bloomberg fits into this whole thing? Because every freaking ad on YouTube right now is a Bloomberg ad. I mean, this guy is throwing every dime. But he's got a track record. Yeah. Like of all of them, he actually he's has actually, a great yeah. track record uh, to run for president. Um, and I, here's this amazing: he's got where's worth fifty billion, and he's only spending like one billion. It's like, what do you need the other like twenty six billion for? So does he strike you then as when I asked you before? Well, what does the the sane left look like, or if they can get out of this thing? What does that moderate Democrat look like? Like, that seems to be far more Bloomberg at this point than, than Biden. I, I wouldn't say that because I think Bloomberg is really a zealot when it comes to his biggest issue, which is the guns. Um, and Don't forget I, the sodas. Well, no, that's not, he doesn't talk about that anymore. No. You know, he really wants the guns well, he tested. he tested the gun thing with the soda thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess that's what I'm ever looking at it. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to that, like in their soci uh, socio sociology, the gun is a heretical object and can never be treated as positive or even neutral. It has to be kind of like cursed. Uh, and you, you don't show it in a positive light whenever possible. So he's really drank the flavor aid on that one and that's what makes him uh, um, quite dangerous. Okay, but if you remove the gun one, uh, and I completely hear you on this, I mean, even just the, there was the shooting at the church and ba basically Bloomberg was condemning the guy that right. shot the shooter. But I the mean, thing is, if you remove the gun thing, he's not running. You see, is the, the problem with these types is mm -hmm. the thing that, the one issue that is the problem is the one issue they care about. Uh, so that would be like Steyer and climate change, right? Because he just gets up there and, right. yeah. Yeah, That's yeah. his only issue, the only thing that matters. So like when Elizabeth Warren starts talking about like, you know, transgender rights, she doesn't care about that. This is something she just, you don't at age, how old is she, 70 something? You don't at age 70 suddenly realize that you want reparations. That's not a thing. This is something she's like, all right, I gotta, she, I think she saw in 2016 two very venal people uh, get the nomination and she's like, all right, this is what politics is. I'm gonna have to sell my soul and basically out Trump or and out Hillary, both of them, and she's doing a piss poor job of it. Do you sense that the train left the station on reparations even? Like they were talking about it a couple months ago at the early debates and even now it's not being talked about, almost as if enough people were like, no, 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 no. I, I, I mean, and you they just kind of it's insane yeah. because basically- well, But they don't need the logic behind it. They just, if they, they just have the issue, right? So it's not like the money or the numbers would have had to have mattered. Sure, but I think also a lot of uh, people in the black community realize that the Democratic Party often takes them for granted. Um, I think that often what, that was trying to be a wedge to get black voters who are very pro Obama, obviously, who are going to be for Biden to pull them away from him because he's not, I don't think, uh, for reparations or at least yet. Uh, and I think it was kind of a, a lead balloon because I agree with you. Like when you have, you, you know, even the center left hearing this and being like, You're, what are you talking about? This is not even practical, even if you want it to happen. Yeah, that's when they uh, pull back a little bit. It's never good in a society when you're gonna be judged and condemned by your father's sins, right? Or not even your father, your grandfather's grandfather's grandfather. It, it, Nothing it, good gonna come it, out it, of that, it's, right? Yeah, right, I mean, at a certain point, it's just basically like we're gonna, tr it, 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 it's almost explicitly, we're gonna take money from them, whoever them happens to be, and give the money to us. And then we're gonna find some ex post facto reason why this isn't just necessary, but the moral thing to do. This is as night follows day. You're feeling pretty good about things, I can tell. I am, so, <laughs> if there's one group that I wanna reach, and I yeah. talk about this constantly on social media and my work, it's people who are blackpilled. Blackpilled is the idea that all, ho all, hope, all hope is yeah. lost. And I think things are so exciting online, and yeah. so exciting in our culture, and things are so beautiful, and we, can I use a curse? You can. We have a shit poster as president. You just asked me if you could say shit poster? Well, no, I'm gonna lead up to the N word. Oh, okay. Um, 
<laughs> when we have a shit poster as president, it is so, it's every day you wake up, you're like, how is this real? Yeah. And when you have the left now understanding the nature of the corporate press and becoming red pilled, and like, I, I welcome them with full love in my heart and open arms. Like, join us. Like, they're the enemy. You, like, me and you are not the enemy. We, are, we might disagree, but we're not each other's enemies. Is that also part of it, I think, that, so I'm with you. I think there's something so hopeful right now. I've been talking about how there's so much fertile ground for ideas. There's so many interesting people yes. popping up all over the place. I didn't know who you were two years ago. Like, there's so many I can say cool the same. Come on, you must have known me. I was on, Fair. The, I was the on YouTube. The, the famous uh, racist. Yeah, comma, <laughs> racist, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yes, there's so much good. And we and yes, there's a part of our brain, I suppose, that gets us focused on the fighting and the negative and all, all, whatever that is, even though I know you think the fighting is good and yeah. whatever. Um, but the other part of this is the people that I'm most sort of interested in right now online are the people that are not purely obsessed with this. So like there's like a certain crew that just, even that I think are smart politically, but like they just tweet politics every fucking day over and over and over and it's so boring and painful. And then there's this other crew and I, I try to do this, you know, like I got my, my dogs in her last days and I post about her a lot and I try to post about food that I'm cooking and other than funny and silly things and things that you're doing. And it's like, I, I think people wanna see more complete people Something yeah, like I, that. I think there's such a move uh, online about self-empowerment and making something of your life. I certainly have been talking about mental health a lot more in my social media. And it, it's so rewarding when you're young to be told, if you want to do it, do it. Like maybe you won't be as successful a podcaster as Dave Rubin, right? But you can be somewhat successful. And even if you fail, you're you, still... You still have to do it. But, but you're also fighting for something that matters to you. And that... Failure is gonna be very rewarding. And you and I have both failed on many things over the past and you keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting. So that the fact that there's so many opportunities to make something yourself be self-actualized, it's such a wonderful time to be alive. And I feel so sad for people who don't, I'm saying you don't have to be the best person on earth, but you have it in your power to be a better person than you are now. And when you put in those terms, like, yeah, it's just that simple. Man, you channeling a little uh, Jordan Peterson over there or what? Oh, I, 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 is, is that what he talks about? I mean, it's a lot, well, it's tw those 12 rules are to, are to live the best life you can. I mean, you're channeling a little Ayn Rand there too. I mean, you're channeling just this idea. It's your life, get I, moving. I was, I'm an immigrant. So the fact that I ha am in a position where I can be on this show shirtless, <laughs> running my mouth, having a you great time. You are wearing time. underwear, right? It's a mix. <laughs> um, Having the time of my life and yeah. having people who have day jobs who can't do this crazy stuff enjoy it and being able to pay my rent is so exciting. And, and to be able to tell people, look, you know, there's so much out there for you to enjoy. It's, 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 and that's what the left doesn't give them. The left, you cannot be this depressed, angry, and anxious for four years. It's just not psychologically healthy. So even if Trump is Hitler, Fine. Find your bliss within this dystopian America that you perceive us to be. Wasn't that that movie Life is Beautiful? That was it, right? Well, I, I haven't seen that movie, but I, I, the, I, I mean, love they that were, message. They, they, were in, uh, they were in a concentration camp, but the father basically kept tricking, I think it was the daughter, that, um, you know, that life is beautiful despite everything. I will, you got to find something. I will always be Ricky with the plastic bag in American Beauty, and it makes me so sad to watch so many people uh, it's because the mentality is, well, I've tried nothing and it hasn't worked, so <laughs> right. I'm going to give up. Yeah. Just try something. It, 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 something is out there for you. Yeah, and that's what's so cool about everything that we have right now. All of the technology you can do. I mean, that's the number one question I get. I go to colleges and people are like, I want to do what you do. And I'm like, do it. Get, I mean, there is literally, what's the best advice, Dave? Do it. Yeah. Put some stuff out there. Don't worry about view counts. Don't try to just be there to destroy everybody. Build something cool. I always tell them, build something cool so that I am forced to put you on the show. Yeah. Force my hand. Don't, don't ask me when you have 10 followers and you're, you know, make it so that one day it's like, Dave has to have this guy on the show. Right, and, and give people something of value. Be earnest. Uh, sarcasm and this sneering is very, very weak and cheap. Uh, and be, cl and here's the other advice, and I'm sure you're gonna agree. I tell people, don't strive to excellence, especially when you're young, you're not gonna be able to do it. Strive to competence. 
if you are competent, if I can rely on you, you are at the 80th percentile, and that is within your means. Yeah, and that's actually a counter in many ways to what people are being told, where it's right. you're just outsourcing everything all the time, and it's not, you're, nothing's your fault, and you shouldn't really work right. that hard, and they'll, have, they'll take care of you. And it's like, we are given the, the counter message that Yeah, be reliable, and that you will have that guest on over and over again. I just, yeah. I messaged you, I'm like, hey, maybe I'm tooting my, toning my horn here, but it's just like, I'm gonna be in LA, let's do a show. You're like, sure. Well, you know, we tried several other people, everything fell through, and then I said, all <laughs> Tulsi right. Tulsi canceled. <laughs> Tulsi canceled, I was like, who is, that, who is that guy that dresses like Tulsi, or she dresses like him, or something? Uh, all right, th this is what we're gonna do, yeah. Malice. I have an idea, yes. it, it just hit me while we're, sitting here because I find when you're having a good conversation like this, interesting ideas pop up. The week before the election, I'm gonna, I wanna do five shows that week. We only usually do one or two shows a week. I wanna do five shows, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I want five unique political people to be on that week. And, and I'm gonna make two comments here that I want you to be part of. I want you to be one of those people because yeah. I want five people from completely different walks of life and, and political persuasions to just give me like what's happening right now before the election. Do I have to fill my eye with blood like Biden? Yeah, your eye has to actually explode. <laughs> you have to announce that men should be in women's prisons, yeah, yeah. like the whole thing. So I want you as one of those people. Sure. That's number one. And number two, I want to do a post-election blowout that night. I want you here. If I have to fly you to LA, whatever we have to do, I okay, want you're you gonna in have the to studio. Fly me. We'll do it. I will fly you here you're gonna have to pay for your dress or whatever else you're gonna be wearing that day. That's but problem. we will fly you here and we'll feed you. How about Let's that? Let's do it. Fair Perfect. enough? Yeah, absolutely. Done. It was a pleasure, my friend. And for more on the hijinks of Michael Malice, uh, follow him on Twitter, it's at Michael Malice. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you wanna watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.